All right, so good, good afternoon. Wish I knew how to say that in Romanian, but I don't. So uh, I'll just go with this. So my name is Dan York, and <clears throat> I'm going to talk a bit about DNSSEC, but before I get going with that, how many of you have deployed DNSSEC right now? Okay, you, yeah, you don't count. You're the next one. Okay, a couple people in here. All right, good. Okay, how many people know what DNSSEC is at all? All right, a few people in here. Okay, well, let's, we're going to talk a bit about this. So first I should mention that DNSSEC is one of the technologies that we at the Internet Society are looking at as ways to bring about a more trusted Internet. Uh, we're we're going to hear a little bit more later about manners and about some of the things around routing security. But what we're here to talk about right now is mechanisms that can be used for creating trust in Internet identifiers and Internet names. And also we're going to talk a little bit about TLS and Dane and how that comes into play. You'll have more on the agenda a bit later. So it really comes down to talking about trust and how do we trust that the information we get out of DNS is the same information as we have in. Uh, up on the slide here, I have a note about a very real case of this that was found, it's actually, um, actually 2014, but it was the researchers at CERT identified that somebody was taking a certain amount of email and they were redirecting it through MX records, poisoned MX records, out to um, somebody else. The mail was actually getting delivered, but in the meantime, it was going to somebody else's servers where who knows what they were doing with it, the type of thing. But this was enabled by the fact that the mail servers received the MX record saying, deliver the mail here, but it was the wrong MX record. They were getting an inform information out of DNS and trusting that in some way. So DNS security extensions, or DNSSEC, is defined in a couple of RFCs. There have been a few more since this time that have uh, done more, but this is what's there. And it talks, about, it, it talks about making sure the info you get out of DNS is the same as what goes in. Let's just take a little bit. Here's the typical thing we, we explain about DNS and how it works. You know, you want to go to www.example.com, so your web browser goes off and it asks the DNS resolver. There's a missing piece there. It's probably there's a stub resolver on your laptop or mobile operating system or something. But that goes off and asks your DNS resolver, where is example.com? How do I get there? And the resolver will send back some number. Okay. Now, if it, ha if it has it in its local cache, that's right there. If it doesn't have it in, in the cache, it's going to do this process, where it's going to go out ultimately to the root and say, where, where is www.example.com? And the root name server is going to say, I don't know, but I know who can give you answers for .com. Then your resolver will go to the .com name server, and it'll say, hey, what's www.example.com? And it will answer back and say, I don't know, but here's who's controlling example.com. And it'll go to that one, the name server, and it'll say, what's www.example.com? And it'll get that answer and come back inside of there. So, DNS works on speed. The first answer that comes back is the one that the resolver takes as the correct answer. It's all about speed. It'll send the message out there. It'll go and get that. It'll come back in there. So if an attacker can get to the right point in a network, they can do something like this. They can go out there, and they can get their response back quicker to the resolver. So the resolver will pass that information back to the client that requested it and say, you know, here's the correct answer. The worst part about this, of course, is that the cache in the local resolver now has this incorrect information, and it will start, it will give out this information for as long as the record is set to expire. So it'll stay there. So it's called a time to live. So what DNSSEC does is it introduces a couple of new records. One's called an RR SIG. There's a DNS key, some pieces like this. But basically, it signs the information in the, in the DNS file. It signs that and says, this information is correct. And it puts a signature on there and says, or it says, this is the information. Here's a signature showing that this is what it looks like. Now, what happens is your resolver checks that information, validates in the terms that we call it. It checks that to, make to see, does this signature match? If the signature matches correctly, then the information's correct. If the signature doesn't work, then it's wrong. Something is wrong. There's some error that's there. 
So in this picture, what happens now is that when that information gets passed back, um, it has these additional records that are used in the checking. Now, you might say, well, so can't an attacker just spoof this, right? Send in a signature. It's got a really good valid signature. It's all happy. The thing is that what's happened in DNSSEC is this process where there are additional records that are inserted at the upper levels, the parent zones in this case, that go and tie it all together so that there's this chain of trust so that not only is my signature there, but it can check that this is the right key. This is the key for example.com. So we'll go through that. So if an attacker tries to go in there, the validating resolver will look at this and say, sorry, that doesn't work. And it will send back, in this case, a serve fail, which is a domain isn't found, server isn't found, that type of thing. And it will basically, it'll prevent you from getting to that website. Now, <clears throat> again, the whole point of this is ensuring that the information you get out of there is there. There's two sides to it. There's a signing side, which is where you go and sign your domains. How many people have, a couple people said they have signed, do you have signed domains? Those who are using, okay, a couple do. All right, the validating is checking. These are two different things. All of you could go home today and turn on your recursive, your name servers, and have them start checking signatures. You could do that today. All you'd have to do typically is uncomment a line of code or turn on a switch that says start validating, and you would start checking DNSSEC signatures. Pretty much all of this, the basic recursive resolvers that people use, whether it's bind or unbound or a Microsoft Windows Server, any of those, they will do DNSSEC validation today. That's something we all can do. It's very, it's easy to go and set, and that will start checking and preventing these kind of attacks or things like that. The signing side involves a little bit more. You need to go and sign your, your zone files, sign the information, and then have some system that will go and keep the signing going. Every time you change the file, it needs to be re-signed. Now, almost all of the authoritative servers, again, things like Bind, PowerDNS, um, NSD, some of those, they all have systems to do the automatic signing. So whenever you change the DNS, it will automatically go and re-sign the files. It'll do that automatically for you. It's more a case of enabling that and making it work like that. Let me talk a little bit about um, the, the uh, validation. Right now, about 15% of all DNS queries globally are being validated. If any of you um, use Google's public DNS, they do all, they validate all answers. Uh, Comcast in North America does that. Here in Romania, I was delighted as I was preparing to find out that uh, one of your large ISPs does, uh, val val seems to validate almost all of its answers. More on that in a minute. So um, about 20% in Europe, and here was my chart about Romania. Romania is currently validating at 43% of all queries coming out of Romania are being validated. So you all are actually ahead of most of Europe. So good news on that. <laughs> You know, yes, you can see over there Sweden, Finland, et cetera. They've got higher levels, but uh, Romania is doing quite well in this. When I looked at the stats, uh, it was RCS, RDS is one that's validating about 92% of all the queries that were coming out of there. Some of the other ones, I mean, you, you know the players that are here more than I do, but you can see there's several large ISPs that are doing um, DNSSEC validation right now. So they're doing the checking side of this. This is information that you can get right off of um, AP NIC, Asia Pacific uh, NIC. AP NIC has a stats site. The URL is right down here, stats.lab.apnic.net. You can go there, and if you click from their main map, if you, actually, if you go to this site, the screen shows a big map. But if you then scroll down the page, you can get into the individual areas, and then from there, you can get into the individual countries. And then I sorted this on the on the column for DNSSEC validations. Um, what's happening over there, I see people looking at this wondering, so what's the, going on here? Over on the right, on the far right hand side where it says samples, um, this is done by a mechanism that Jeff Houston and the AP NIC team has where they use um, ads that appear on the side of people browsing in, in Google. 
and they do something where it where the ad goes and triggers some some uh, requests to various different servers, some of which are good and bad, and they can validate that off of this. So the number of samples means that the the largest number of people um, that they've measured from that particular network or AS, and so usually it's a good sign for the larger ISPs in that particular region because they're being able to to, uh, to do that. But anyway, you can go to this site stats.labs.apnic.net if you're curious about this. This is the validation side. So the good news is you're seeing a good amount of validation happening here in Romania already. This other column where it says uses Google PDNS is a measure of how many of those samples use Google's public DNS servers. And the reason that comes in is you get into some countries that have 90% uh, DNSSEC validation or higher and it's because all of the ISPs don't operate their own DNS resolvers. They just use Google's public DNS in some way. So, but over here, it's a low percentage. So you're actually seeing it's a, a pretty good use of, your, of the own reservers there. So on the signing side, it's a bit more complicated because the person op who has the domain, example.com, example.ro, whatever, has to go and trigger the signing of that. Their operator, whoever is using DNSSEC, needs to go and, um, and sign that zone, work with it. And then there's another little step that the, reg the registrar needs to get involved and transmit a, what's called a, a little record in there, a DS record that has to go up to the root to tie it all together. There's some pieces on this that we as a community are looking at how to automate and make it a little bit better. But overall, Kevin mentioned earlier, we have some DNSSEC deployment maps that show what's going on and we, um, we're seeing a good number of support out there. Um, here were some of the top domains that had signed in the past while, the number of uh, signed domains at the second level. Netherlands at .nl is the leader in the raw number of domains with about 45% of all .nl domains are signed. You can see the list on going down there. Brazil is another place, Sweden. Um, some of these are going on. You'll see down at the very bottom, .bank is one of these new GTLDs, and as part of what they do, all of the domains that are put up into that new GTLD are signed just as part of it, as part of what they do in, in that, with that new GTLD. This is some statistics off of another site maintained by Rick Lamb at, uh, at, at ICANN, is the one who does this. So I want to move on and talk a bit about one of the applications of <clears throat> DNS, and we talked a bit about... Um, TLS in some spaces, and you might say, I've already got SSL. How do I, you know, what do I need this for? TLS, what, we, what used to be called SSL, but we now call it as TLS, is about confidentiality. The challenge, you know, if we think about it in a web browser environment, you know, we get the green lock, which says we're doing a TLS encrypted connection. The challenge is, how do we know if we're using the correct DNS or TLS certificate? How do we know it's the right one? Yes, it validates coming from some certificate authority or CA. But anybody know, what can, is there any restrictions on which CAs can sign for which domain names? No, there's a trick, there's a thing here. A, uh, a, any certificate, any certificate authority can issue a TLS certificate for any domain anywhere, if you can get them to issue a certificate for you. So you can get into a situation where a firewall or an attacker can give back a, 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 you know, a, a correct TLS certificate. You'll see a green lock. Everything looks good. But in fact, they're logging that information. They're doing something like that. They're performing a man-in-the-middle attack with TLS. But to the user, it looks like you've got the green lock. You've got that secure encrypted connection. You think you've got it, but it's not the right way. Now, there's a number of solutions that are being proposed for, for how to solve this issue. I'm going to talk about the Dane one that we're looking at, which is, uh, which is how do you work with this? Because this is a problem. The CA system, the certificate authority system that we have, is, is very broken uh, in a whole number of ways. There was just a report recently um, that Mozilla was blocking a, a, a TLS certificate that was issued by a, a certificate authority that was for somebody else. They'd issued it for the wrong person, but it was being propagated out there, and so people could go to this site. They thought they were getting to the correct site, but it was wrong. It's all of this issue. 
you've got you know, over 1,500 certificate authorities that can issue these, domain, these is things. So what Dane does is Dane says, let me put into DNS either the certificate, the, the actual certificate, or the name of the certificate authority that should be able to issue um, a TLS certificate for this domain. So when I'm connecting to HTTPS colon slash slash ronog.ro or example.ro or whatever, I can find out from there, am I using the correct TLS certificate? So what you're doing is then, and if it's encrypted with DNSSEC, you're being able to know that that really is the correct example. So let me look at the, at the browser example again. What would happen here is that now, in addition to the DNS key and the RRSIG, you'd get a TLSA record. And the TLSA record would be this pointer to what, what certificate should be used for this domain, what should work. A browser that would, was equipped with Dane could check this and say, wait a minute, you're not connecting to the correct site. And then it could either put up a, a warning or at least prompt the user in some way, perhaps prohibit it, depending upon that. Now, this is how it could work in a browser. The reality is that in the browser environment so far has been re reluctant to do this because it adds more time delay, more latency to go and do an, an extra check. And browsers are all about speed. But one place that, that this has really taken off has been in email. Because it turns out that if you want to do a secure email connection between two servers, there's no really good way to get the certificate of the other end to be able to be sure that you're getting an encrypted um, connection in the delivery of email from one site to the other. Jan's going to come up in a little bit and talk about a specific case that he's been working on of doing this with Let's Encrypt, which is a mechanism for generating um, TLS certificates. But there's now uh, several thousand web, um, email servers that are that are working with this, that are using Dane to provide a TLS certificate to know how to get there. Um, the German, the Bundes, uh, oh, I'm going to mess up the name of it, but it's the German security agency, um, just recently issued guidelines saying that to communicate with the German government, they were now saying, they were recommending that you should have Dane um, protected TLSA records. So that you should use this in communication with it. A number of the German mail providers and others are now actually advertising Dane protection as part of what they, they provide in what they're doing. So a number of places are using this as a mechanism to raise the level of trust that we can provide in, in email, in how we can make truly encrypted email between servers and work with us. There's a number of resources. These slides are, will be available so you can go and find them, but you'll be able to go and, and learn more about this through the Deploy360 site we also have uh, RFC 6698 is for Dane, some of the other tools that are out there. I want to wrap up <clears throat> by talking a little bit about something brand new that's coming up out of the IETF that I want to have people be aware of, and that is some work going on around the privacy of DNS. Because what people look at is the fact that when you're going and querying for www.example.com, uh, that query from your local computer to your DNS resolver is going in the clear. And so that can be across whatever your local network, across a larger network, across the internet if you were using Google's public DNS servers. That query can happen out there and can be seen. And you can start to get a log of what's there. You can start to see what's going on. It can be used in surveillance. It's this part right here between your web browser, your local computer, and your DNS resolver. All of those queries right now are visible. So I can build a pretty good track record of exactly where Jan is going if I can watch where his, his DNS, you know, what he's querying on DNS. So what's happened as a result is that the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, has developed a group called Deprive, or DNS Privacy. And what they're looking at is how do we go and encrypt this connection between the local system and the recursive resolver. This is starting to move, it's been moving along really well. The whole point is really now to run DNS over TLS and to be able to provide that encryption of the connection. Uh, this is starting to be available in some of the recursive resolvers that are out there. And so I, I mentioned this really to let people know you're gonna see more of this work, this happening. 
This is going to be coming out uh, soon as these kind of things go. With that, I want to just kind of wrap up and say this, the beauty of deploying DNSSEC is that you can look at, you know, raising the level of trust that people have in the services you offer. You know, being sure that people can know they're getting to your content and your information. If you're publishing information in DNS, DNSSEC allows you to be able to go and say, this is the information that I want out there. You can be sure that people are getting to it. They're not getting to bogus websites or other places like that. You also get the ability to use Dane, some of these new features. Uh, what I would encourage you all to do as you head out from here, I'd encourage you to go and deploy DNSSEC validation if you can. Um, if you can do it directly with your IT team, whatever else, all of that is turning on the checking of signatures. You know, if, if you do that, then a year from now or at the next RONOG, if you look at these DNSSEC statistics, maybe Romania will be even higher than 43% and keep on going up from that. But the checking of the validation is, is something that anybody can go and enable. The one caveat I'll tell you is this. You do have to then be aware, or your trouble, your trouble desk, your help desk needs to be aware, that a failed validation can cause a problem that people can't get to a website. There have been issues where somebody has gone and um, on the operation side, they messed up and they didn't renew a DNSSEC key. And so they had an expired key out there, and it wound up causing a problem where people couldn't get to their website, people who were checking this. OK, there were operational issues like that that happened. And so you just need to be aware when you enable validation, if you're an ISP, if you're doing something like that, that if people call in and they say to you, hey, I can't get to this website on your network, but I can on my mobile phone. What's going on? One of the issues might be you're checking it. There's a real. You know, you're checking that, but maybe the mobile operator is not, or vice versa, whatever it may be. So you just need to be aware of that. But if you go back and enable validation, you will start to get the benefits of the added checking that's happening on here. If you can, sign your domains. We're going to hear a little bit more about things happening in the, in the .ro TLD, and, and you can look at how can you sign your domains to be able to have those there. Also, I encourage people to go and help promote support of this Dane protocol. It's look at how you could use it for your mail servers. Look at how you could use it for the other piece of your infrastructure and what's there. I think that's all I wanted to say right now. Um, I've, I'm available for questions from around here, but uh, I'll throw it out now. Any questions right now? Yes, I see a couple back there. Somebody, do we have a microphone we can run out there? Yeah, just... Is it on? Uh, yeah. Hello? Oh, there it is. Yeah, it's on. You just have to give it a test. So I have a, a, a couple of questions. Is Dane uh, similar to the certificate pinning mechanism in, in browsers? Um, no, it solves a different issue. So, so he's asking, is it similar to certificate pinning? What certificate pinning is, is in the browser, the certificate basically pins, as it is. It says, this is the certificate to use going to google.com, for instance. Or the preferred CA. Or Well, yeah. And, and so it says, this is the one that's going to be there. The um, the, it, and then if you try to get there and it, and it sees a certificate that is not that one, then it will say there's a problem here. You can't get there, whatever else. Uh, it's the, the issue with pinning, pinning is a very good solution. The, the challenge with pinning is that pinning is what's called trust on first use. It assumes that you're getting to the, to the, the site correctly the first time you get there. And then you get the TLS certificate and you pin the certificate that's there. The challenge can be that if you go to an attacker's website first, you wind up pinning the attacker's web certificate in, inside your browser so that when you then go to connect to the real site, it will say, I'm sorry, that's not the correct site because, because the certificate's been pinned. Dane can work in co and can complement that by providing that certificate the first time or, or a second check on the certificate so then you know you're pinning the correct certificate. Okay. And, and the second question has to do with uh, DNS privacy. Mm -hmm. Can this, because all the, the DNS queries will be encrypted, uh, does this affect on the defense side, the security defense side, uh, the security appliances that rely on, on uh, checking DNS traffic for potential malware and things like that? Yes. This will hide the malicious traffic as well. This is one of those things the, the, that, this is why I raised this, is because 
for the, the folks doing DNS appliances or doing DNS security services, things like that. They need to be aware that this is coming because if it does do the encryption between the client and the resolver, then yes, anything monitoring that local network, okay, for any kinds of compliance issues, things like that, other stuff, they will have that same, they will have the inability to get to the information. So yes, it will affect it. So building block lists or blacklists based on DNS will not be uh, right, viable now, anymore. <laughs> well now, except of course that on an enterprise, for instance, in an enterprise network where they have control of the machines, et cetera, I mean, they always have the option they could turn off that encryption between the, the, the client and the, and the um, local recursive resolver, you know, if they wanted to. So they could do, there's other ways an enterprise could solve that. Okay. Next question. Thank how you. Much, how much time do I have? Well, I'd say one more question. Okay. Uh, thank you. Well, one question. Uh, right now, DNSSEC is a major vector for uh, DDoS amplification. Uh, is something being done about that? I mean, uh, RFC uh, to uh, force TCP responses for DNSSEC or something like that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, so DNSSEC is certainly one of the mechanisms there. Um, you saw in the earlier presentation other, other mechanisms like NTP, other pieces like that. I mean, it is one of the challenges that, uh, that we have in general with this is that, is that the larger size DNS queries that we're getting are being used as amplification mechanisms. So yes, I mean, you know, forcing things, moving things to TCP is one mechanism to do that. Um, and uh, I mean, this is one of the realities that we do have to work with in general as larger DNS packets are coming along. Yes, but uh, NTP is solvable. The NTP amplification problem yes. is solvable. But uh, DNSSEC uh, is, uh, is, is an ongoing problem. It is, it okay. is. Uh, nobody implemented it. So, I mean, it is, DNSSEC um, in the amplification question is an, a challenge that I mean, the larger community is still working on. Um, DNSSEC alone is not one of the, I mean, we're also getting the issues where we have just larger packet sizes because we're working with IPv6 answers and other pieces around this. So it, it is a larger question in general. And uh, the second question uh, about the uh, delay in response to the clients. If we do the DNS uh, verification, DNSSEC verification, uh, how would this impact the delay? It's increased 10 times the delay to our customers or something like that? Um, I, I think the, the regular DNSSEC validation does not introduce very much of a delay, you know, in, in terms of what you're doing. I mean, if you look at, and it's being used heavily in production, you know, where I am back in the United States, Comcast, uh, has turned it on for their 20 million customers that they're doing within, um, within the United States and, and have had no issues with that, you know, no, no kinds of problems with that. So it's being used very heavily in, in real live production issues without, um, you know, concerns that people are seeing, so. Uh, they use a special hardware uh, SSL offloading or something like that? Or I'm not sure what, the, um, when, they were, um, when they were here talking about, I think they're, I mean, they've got their recursive resolvers. I don't know their exact setups that they're using, but. Okay, thank you. I think I saw one more question. Uh, well, you okay. know, maybe we need to call a George or close here. Um, okay, well, if, if it's a quick question, one more quick question. <laughs> Sorry, was there someone else over here that was up, wanted a question? Can DNSSEC solve the issue of the man in the middle attack? Well, it protects against one man in the middle attack, which is the, the DNS middle, man in the middle attack. So it prevents the it, it prevents somebody from spoofing the packets and redirecting you to another website. So if you think about phishing emails or, or things like that, that... How can it do that? I mean, I can rewrite my client's traffic, the, the DNS traffic, and lie to him about everything. Right, but if the client is checking the DNS... So I guess it depends. Are you the recursive resolver? Uh, no, but I'm between his resolver and the internet. I You're have compromised the a machine between his resolver and the internet. Yes. And I will lie to the resolver, and the resolver in turn will lie to the client. So if the resolver is doing DNSSEC checking, and if, that's, if the zone was signed, then the resolver should, should... Yes, but I can lie also by the, about the signature. No. How come? Because that goes into the, the chain of trust that happens. And so you could, you could create a bogus signature, and you could put it on there but the signature will not be signed by the key for the domain. So let's say 
you're trying to spoof the Ronog site, okay, and you were doing that, if Ronog.ro was signed, it will have a, a, a signature of its key that goes up into .ro. Yeah, and, and, and all from that. Then the client will ask, will ask the TLD about the signature, right? Yes. But I will lie for the response of the TLD because I'm in the middle. I but, intercept all the traffic. But then you will lie. You, you will. It'll go up to the top level of the domain. So you'd have to spoof. Which for this. I will intercept also and lie again. But then here's where here's where it is. The local resolver has a hint has a has a hint file that is that shows the top level root key, and so you can't yeah, okay. spoof that. So the chain will break there. So you can try. I will. You can try it. I will. OK. <laughs> All right. All right, I'm being called off. OK. okay. Um, glad to talk to you all. If you... Thanks, Dan. Um, Dan's here. Uh, so we, we already heard Yes, Romania is a kind of success story with DNSSEC. So let's hear from the people themselves who are doing this uh, in Romania. So I'd like to introduce... Uh, Kathleen Lianka from um, um, ICI uh, Row TLD, who will uh, um, well, give us a case study of, of uh, what they've been working on. 